C-130 on a taxiway. C-130 on a taxiway. Good morning, America and the rest of the world. Sandra J. Hobson here, reporting in at 2206 Cecil B. Moore Avenue. This used to be the 23rd Powell Police Athletic League, this lot right here behind me, and some of the best fighters from Philadelphia came through this boxing gym right here. The most prominent among them was former heavyweight champion and Olympic gold medalist, Smoking Joe Frazier. This used to be 22nd and Columbia before they changed the name to Cecil B. Moore, a man who insisted that black children be allowed to go to Jirai College. Anyway, maybe about uh, 37 years ago, it was 1983, the 23rd Pal assembled one of its most accomplished boxing teams who were under the age of 15. Derek Fats Bernie was the team's captain. A fellow by the name of Sean Willis, whom I affectionately call Buster Boxer, was present. Willis Butchie Pryor was on this boxing team. Tyrone Porter was on this boxing team. Terry Wynn McLaughlin was on this boxing team. And yours truly was on this boxing team. We went up to the area of 40th and Lancaster used to be some type of theater or gymnasium there. And there we would fight in the 1983 Junior Olympics. And while we were there, I would meet guys that I would become quite fond of. Leroy Bucky Davis from our Southwest Philly, Richard Evans from now South Philly, and a lot of other good guys that I would become quite fond of. Well, that night, the 23rd Powell, our boxing team, showed absolute dominance in the tournament. Fats would get a walk over, and so would Leroy Bucky Davis. Well, however, maybe about a month or two later, the two would square off at an exhibition up at the ABC Boxing Recreational Center, and it was a barn burner, outstanding. But nevertheless, that night, our fighters, we, dominated the tournament. But unfortunately, we were the victims of bad decisions. The only one who would walk away with a victory that night would be Terry Wayne McLaughlin because he had beat his man so badly they couldn't help but get a fight to him. I squared off against a fella by the name of Willie Reddish III. And at the time when I was fighting this fella, I had no idea that he was boxing royalty because his grandfather, Willie Reddish Sr., and his father, Willie Reddish Jr., these guys were some real big shots because they had trained a lot of great fighters. Sonny Liston was one of them, former heavyweight champion. Uh, Curtis Parker was another one of them. A good hard fight of dude by the name of Chuck Davis. The Reddishes were a real big deal, and if their fighter had a fight and the decision was even remotely close, that decision was going to the Reddishes. Well, the fight wasn't even close. I smoked Willie Reddish the third. I mean, he put up a spirited fight, but there was no way they gave him that fight. But that's neither here nor there. That night, me and my comrades who were robbed of our rightful victories, we walked away from that fight with a sour taste in our mouth about boxing and scoring. Even to this day, 
I hate to see questionable scoring because you have no idea how it breaks the spirits of a fighter to have a fight taken from him. You're talking about your sweat and your tears. Fast forward a whole bunch of years later, you'll see the Martin Luther King Recreational Center behind me. I was doing a documentary on the great Bobby Boogaloo Watts, middleweight sensation who defeated marvelous Marvin Hagler, former middleweight champion. And my friend of mine, Ike Mayfield, turned me on to a gentleman who I squared off against years before, Willie Reddish Jr. So I went in there and I met with Mr. Reddish and somewhere along that conversation of he and I talking together, I brought night, the 1983 event between me and his son to his attention. And Mr. Reddish said, well, we beat you. I said, sir, you guys robbed me and you stuck me up that night because you guys were big shots and I was just a small kid from North Philadelphia. You should be ashamed of yourself, sir. Now, this was all done in a friendly jousting spirit. There was no animosity because how the hell could I be mad at Mr. Reddish for something that happened more than 35 years ago? Well, Mr. Reddish, in his infamous wisdom, he checkmated me with one response. He said to me in regards to the decision, he said, young man, that night when we fought, he said, what did the judges say? And from that moment forward, Mr. Reddish and I had become bosom buddies. Now keep in mind, I had bumped into Willie Reddish, the young man that I squared off against, a whole bunch of times. And he and I had a cordial, warm relationship when we saw each other, but his father, Mr. Reddish, that was my main man. I liked Mr. Reddish so much, I even went as far as to introduce him to my mother-in-law. He was a great guy, and from Mr. Reddish, I learned a lot about him, his father, and his family. I learned that Mr. Reddish was a banker. I learned that Mr. Reddish had learned a lot from his Uncle Frank, who went to Baltimore. I learned a lot about the Reddishes, and I was hoping that Mr. Reddish and my mother-in-law would hit off. But unfortunately, Mr. Reddish would expire before him and my mother-in-law would become close. They had become good friends, and they had a warm relationship, and they were definitely cool, but he had expired before they would get any closer. Fast forward, maybe about a month or two after Mr. Reddish passed, I was over at Cherry Hill at one of the restaurants and I was sitting there dining and Mr. Reddish was the farthest thing from my mind. However, a gentleman came and sat down next to me who reminded me of Mr. Reddish. And before I knew it, I had broken out into tears. I had no idea that I had missed Mr. Reddish as much as I did or that I liked him that much, but I did. He was a hell of a guy, and I loved him like an uncle, like a father. From that point forward, I concluded, as soon as I finished my documentary on Bobby Boogaloo Watts, I would do a documentary on Willie Reddish and the Willie Reddish family. So with that said, from this point forward, I am gonna turn this program over to the individuals who were as generous enough with their time to give me their input, their experiences on Willie Reddish Jr. and the Reddish family. Bam! 1947. Yes, sir. I was 14 years old. Bam! So I went out for the team. I was probably the only black kid that went out for the baseball team. And uh, at that time, um, so I went out for it, but when it came time to give out the baseball uniforms... You couldn't get one. I did not get one. Wow. But I had originally lived at 21st and Master. Okay. And my best friend lived at 21st and Master. I told him of the situation. He said, well, why don't you come out for the 23rd district? 23rd Powell. Powell. 
Right. Which I did. Yes, sir. I met a wonderful police officer by the name of Frank Wolf. Frank Wolf, got you. I made the team. They had a junior team and a senior team. Now we're going to get to the boxing. Now. Yes, sir. A junior team and a senior team. I was the starting shortstop for both. Wow. Junior and senior. We won both championships. Whipped them kids from the third, from a 26 in York all the time. We won both of them. But one day, now, I have to go back with my religious beliefs. God had a plan for us. What had happened, he walks over to me, Frank Wolf, at 26 in Jefferson, where the playground is. Are you familiar with it at 26 yes, sir. in Jefferson? Yes, sir. The wreck he, is what they call yeah, the it. Wreck. ABC, ABC Boxing Gym. Right. He says to me, now why he said it to me, I have no idea. He says to me, you know, I would like to start boxing at the 23rd District. Wow. But I don't know anyone who can train a fighter. Mm. I say to him, maybe my father would, because my father was training me in the basement when I was a little boy, how to jab and throw right hands and everything. So I said, maybe my father would train him if I fight. Okay. They met, and we went in the basement of 19th and Oxford, cleaned it out, and built the gym. You mean the place that's right next to the to the firehouse? To the firehouse. Yeah. A lot of these young people wouldn't know that that used to be the police station, let alone yeah, the 23rd the boxing. Yeah. Gym. A lot of these young people wouldn't know that, no. sir. Matter of fact, I didn't know until you just told me. Is honestly right? speaking. Yeah. That's that was the 23rd district. We went in the basement of the of the 19th and Oxford, cleaned all the coal out, shoved it somewhere else, and that's where the 23rd District Pal began. Wow. And my father was the trainer. Willie Reddish Senior. Yes, sir. The man who got it started. Yes, sir. The man who trained Sonny Liston. Yes, sir. Joe Frazier. Jim, um, okay. Gil Turner. Gil Turner, another Gypsy Philly Joe, box legend. Gypsy Joe Harris. Curtis Parker, Rudy Donata. I can name them so many of them. Take it away, young man. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for having me, Chuck. Hey, Willie, it's my pleasure, sir. I want to start off by um, <clears throat> stating some facts about my grandfather. He was born in Bamberg, South Carolina in 1913 came up to Philadelphia as most people from the South did looking for work and better and better opportunities. He began boxing in Bamberg and continued his amateur career here in Philadelphia. He was a very popular heavyweight contender. He fought the likes of Joe Walcott and other great heavyweights such as that during his time. He then became a boxing trainer, and while he was in North Philadelphia, he had the opportunity to start training fighters at the 23rd Street Pal. There was nothing there at the time, so he went into the basement of a building, built the ring, built the boxing gym, and started to recruit young men from the neighborhood to begin training there. I treat them all so good. I treat them, you know, I, I don't try to, you they, they, they never hear me curse. They've never, as long as I had that gym, I don't, I don't think not one of them heard me curse. That's a cursing and kind. They never see me come in the gym with a drink of whiskey. I always, anything that they want, I try to do it for them. Seven feet tall. If a Johnny seven feet tall. 
all. I won't be messing with him at all. You're left, you're left. You're left, you're left. You're left, right left. You're left, right left. My grandfather put his time, energy, and focus on helping young men develop their boxing skills. With Gil Turner, Gil Turner fought Kid Gavilan here in Philadelphia for the Waterway Championship. Gil Turner lost in the 12th round, I believe, a 12th round knockout. But it was the largest grossing title fight at that time as far as revenue and as far as attendance. Sonny Liston came to Philadelphia and my grandfather worked with him through most of his professional career. During the initial fights with Floyd Patterson, my grandfather was in his corner. And he was in the corner the night we ran into Cassius Clay, also known as the great Muhammad Ali. Sir, when I hear you say we ran into the to, to the great Cassius Clay, sir. You're talking like you were present, young man. And I, I don't I don't think you were born because I think maybe you're maybe like a week older than me. What do you mean, we? I was not present, but oh, I like okay. but I heard the story so much, it was as though I was I was there. Okay, I'll take that. When when we signed when my grandfather and and the and, and the managers behind Sun Liston um, signed to fight uh, Muhammad Ali or Cassius Clay. Cassius Clay didn't have any punching power. And we thought of, and they thought it would be an easy fight. What they underestimated was his speed and his ability to take a shot and keep moving. And of course, the rest is history. Um, Sonny lost to Muhammad Ali in that first fight. And in the second fight, it was rumored that he took a dive. Just to touch on um, the Sonny Liston fight, um, I, for one, I have heard rumors about that fight. One of the uh, rumors that I heard, and again, this is a rumor, I do not know if it's true or not, so please don't beat me up on this. But one of the rumors that I heard surrounding the Sonny Liston fight was that uh, members of the Nation of Islam had a uh, babysit. They babysitted Sonny Liston's family, and uh, they kind of sort of just sat on him because they wanted Brother Cassius, as they refer to him. They wanted Brother Cassius to uh, to win that fight. Again, I don't know if that's true or not. I also heard other rumors, possibly mob ties. So I don't know. I wasn't born, and Willie wasn't born. So we can't really speak intelligently on something, but we can at least point out that this is what we heard. Well, young man, take it away, sir. That is that is correct. Um, there are a lot of rumors regarding threats on Senator Liston's life, the, the life of his wife um, during that time. Um, he was also, it is well documented, he was also a collector uh, for the mafia but boxing has always been corrupt and it was very corrupt back then um, and if you look at the second fight which we call the phantom punch punch that nobody nobody saw um, to see a man the size of Sonny Liston with the strength of Sonny Liston to roll around the ring um, was pretty un unbelievable and, and in fact was unbelievable so, as we all know, Sonny died um, some years later. Uh, they say with a drug overdose, but Sonny let, never used drugs, uh, didn't like needles, um, and probably had some secrets that some folks didn't want to be known. So may he rest in peace. Tell me about when your grandfather made you go into the ring, sir, and glove him up and, and start engaging in pugilism, sir. So. I didn't have a choice, to be quite honest. Um, when I was 12 years old, my father basically said, you're going to the gym, you're going to learn how to fight. And that was it. I mean, back in those times, um, you know, if your dad said do something, you just went ahead and just did it. Dad, I don't want to do it. <laughs> you, didn't, you didn't have an option. Um, and once, you know, once you begin to learn how to fight, 
it kind of gets into your blood, as as you know, Chuck. Yes, I do, sir. Um, you know, you 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 see the physical transformation of of your body. Um, you build the confidence. You know, you learn how to slip punches. You learn how to work off the jab. Um, and during that time, in the '80s, you know, uh, we had heroes like Muhammad Ali, uh, Sugar Ray Leonard, Marvin Hagler, Tommy Hearns, uh, Larry Holmes. We had all these great boxers and great heroes that we could look at fight on these big time fights where literally the whole world would stop when there was a big fight to look at. Um, so that helped as well. Um, being in the gym, I would recommend every young man uh, between the ages of 12 and 16 years old to learn how to box. Not because they're gonna be world champions, but because it teaches them discipline, it teaches them self-confidence, it teaches them physical fitness, and it's uh, it's a sport that keeps them healthy, physically. Um, so I'd rather have a young guy throw a left hook than pull out a gun and shoot another young man. Um, but my grandfather, he was he was a no-nonsense trainer. Boxing was his was his love. Boxing was his life. Um, and when you came in the gym, he gave you attention because he wanted you to learn how to fight the way he wanted you to know how to fight. Working off the jab, hooking off the jab, setting up the right hand, going from the body to the head, punching in combinations, all those kinds of things that make fighters great. Well, sir, you did say something, right? And, and like when you spoke earlier, you spoke of, of, of guys that we, um, that we admire, the great Ray Leonard, uh, Tommy Hearns, Marvin Hagler, one of my favorites, et cetera, et cetera. But I will say this, when I, I, I even though I started my career at a gym called the Great Diamond Street Gym, right. then I went to a gym where a guy named Johnny Barr trained people, and then I bounced to 23rd Pal and eventually the Champs Gym. I met local boxing greats. I met guys like uh, the white Muhammad Kwari, right. Tyrone the Butterfly, Crawley. Right. But one person in particular, I met Curtis Parker. Right. Curtis Parker, who was a short middleweight. Right. Uh, I later would work with Curtis Parker at the Hospital University of Pennsylvania. Right. But I happen to know, sir, that at some point Curtis Parker was affiliated with 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 your grandfather. That's right. Can you can you can you shine some light because Curtis Parker was a guy who I spent some time around. He always act like an elder brother or uncle right. toward me. But I know I would learn that Curtis Parker in association with Milton Bailey and your grandfather, he was in all actuality one of your fighters. Yes, sir. Um, my grandfather started training Curtis Park when he was about 12, maybe 13 years old. Um, took him up to through the amateurs. Curtis was a national amateur champion. Um, he was an undefeated pro, 16 and 0, with 13 knockouts. He was a headliner at the Spectrum, headliner at the Blue Horizon. Um, he was a USBA middleweight champion when he beat uh, David Love, who was Angelo Dundee's fighter. And he was uh, three fights away from, uh, two fights away from fighting uh, marvelous Marvin Hagler. Uh, Kurt, Kurt was a ball of dynamite. Uh, he had a very simple game plan. He was in your, he was in your chest. As soon as, as soon as the bell rang, he was right in your chest, and he was he, he was staying in your chest throughout the fight. And two things were going to happen: you were going you were going to get tired of the beating, or you were going to get knocked out. That was it. Um, Kurt made a decision to fight a guy by the name of um, Davison out of Detroit. Who White Davis. White Davis out of Detroit, uh, who was also um, Don King's middleweight. And Dwight Davidson was about 6'1", 6'2". Kurt lost a split decision to him. Um, and during during those times, if you, if you lost one fight, that took you out of contention. And then he lost another fight, another split decision to Mustafa Hamshaw. And once that happened, uh, Kurt left my grandfather for about three or four fights. 
and then he came back. But grandfather explained to Kurt coming up that he was a 25 fight fighter. And what that, what that means is, because he has a very aggressive style and because he has to take punishment in order to give punishment. And he's not a graceful boxer like a Muhammad Ali or, or, or a big devastating puncher like George Foreman. He's taking shots. And usually after about the 25th fight going into the 30th fight or during that time period is when guys like Kirk drop off. Um, so once he had the two losses, um, and then he had some subsequent losses, um, his, his career was pretty much, pretty much over. Had we avoided the Davison fight and went straight for Hagler, um, or maybe Vito Anafermo, which would have been a good fight for Kurt, because he was a coming, he was a going down the hill ex middleweight champion, a white Italian out of New York City, which would have been a blockbuster fight for Kurt. Um, maybe things would have been different. One thing about boxing, boxing is subjective, right. and and when a fight is close, or sometimes even if someone loses. Right. Um, you know, it's all up to the judges. You know, we talk about corruption in boxing, and you you never really know unless you knock a guy out. A close fight it can go either way. I watched footage on Curtis Parker. Um, I seen Curtis Parker against Mike the Silk Elijah Day. Okay. Okay. Right. I think Curtis Parker won that fight. Right. I watched Curtis Parker when he fought Alex Ramos, great middleweight out of out of that out of New war. York City. That was a war. I think Curtis Parker won that fight. But once again, in respect to Alex Ramos and Mike DeSilco Live today, I'm biased to Curtis Parker. Right. But I personally think Curtis Parker won that fight. Right. Uh, I saw Curtis Parker. Curtis Parker was a beast. Right. Basically, everybody I ever seen Curtis Parker box in the in the uh, champs gym, Curtis Parker pretty much mauled him. Right. I'm not going to call out any names because once again out of respect for all these great guys because you've heard me say on these airways time and time again boxing made me the man who I am right I didn't look up to people like Dr. J and Wilbur Montgomery I looked up to fighters and I said that to say this most of the guys that I ever seen Curtis Parker box in the gym when he was doing his prime Curtis Parker pretty much beat these guys up and we talking about a handful of guys who were world champions or top-notch contenders. However, hearing Willie say uh, Kurt was a pretty much a 25-fight fighter, yeah, because in, in that gym, Curtis Parker was also taking a lot of damage and punishment, even though he had a nice slip game. Right. But, again, that's one of those things. I, myself, seen Curtis Parker start to fall off because... In that gym, guys that uh, he once mauled and beat up, the tide started turning with so, Curtis Parker. So the other, the other thing that you got to understand is, okay, guys turn pro at 18, right? If they fight an average of two, maybe three fights a year, which is you fighting every three three months, which is which is about average for an up and coming fighter. Um. You know, you fight three fights a year. If you if if you divide three in the twenty-four, you're fighting for eight years. Wow. Right? Think about that. So now you're 18, so now you so now you're about 20, 26 years old. We're looking at 27, almost at 30. But you've been you you've really been fighting for 18 years. Wow. Because you start fighting at 10, 11, 12 years old. So that's why, that's where the 25 fight fighter thing comes in. Guys like Ali, they got about 35 fights in them. Wow. See, old school trainers know this. Wow. And and see, the thing about it is, just hearing, just, just hearing this boxing wisdom that was passed on to you by your grandfather, right. later your father. I mean, you're talking about things I've never in my life even considered. Right. So, for for example, if Ali Ali turn, turns pro at 18, and if he's a 35, 36 fight fighter, you divide three into 36. That's 12, 12 years. 12 plus 18 is 30. Mm. 
Now you look at Ali's career after the age of 30. And you look at it before the age of 30. You can see the prime and then it starts to, starts to decline. He had to change his style just to get through fights. Sometime you have to realize that you get to a point in boxing, if you're a boxer. Yes, sir. And you can't go over that point. Right, right. You see, so you get there and, and you know, you, God said you can't go any further now. Right, right. So that's what we would do with our boxers. We would get them to a point and we see that we didn't want to hurt them. Get yes, them sir. hurt, so we say, okay, stop. Sir, something that's missing in boxing, and you said something that I really appreciate, because a lot of guys don't really care about their fighters. No. A lot of guys, they do, they, they treat their fighters as if they're object. You have to, Chuck Mills just came in the room, folks. We had to acknowledge that gentleman. But you, you they treat their fighter, you, you have to look at your fighter as if you would look at your, your child. Absolutely. And if you don't have that, Again, something that you and your father, you, you guys both, you, you guys done a spectacular job taking guys to the, to the title. And back then, sir, there wasn't as many championships as it was there now. Only seven or eight, I think it was eight to eight weeks. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Eight weeks. And if you won a championship back during those times, folks, you uh, you won a championship. I mean, I don't mean to take the attention off of uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Reddish, but it's something I feel passionate about. There's so many championships out there now. So I, I personally, I've lost interest in boxing. I don't really watch it anymore. But I said that to say during a time when back in the, uh, the 60s, 70s, 70s, and before, if there would have been a, a bunch of championships, I know Boogaloo would have won one. We would have got one out of Gypsy Joe Harris. He would have been the champion. So, again, we're talking about a time where there was one championship. One. Or maybe two when they came out with the WBC. Yes. But, but you know, but there were only eight eight weight divisions. Eight weight divisions, and, and the, the fighters were ranked by Ring Magazine. Yes, sir. And I'm down here in Annapolis, Maryland. Um, I'm meeting up with Chuck the Boxer Davis. Now, Chuck is a good guy. He's a um, former prize fighter. You're going to hear a lot about him during the interview and his interaction with uh, Willie Reddish and his career. Now, the only problem I got with uh, Chuck... Chuck is a damn sailor, a squid, and I was a U.S. Marine, and the problems that Marines had with squids was squids shitted on Marine life, but I'm not going to hold that against Chuck because he's going to grant me a great interview. My name is uh, Chuck Davis. I was born and raised in uh, South Jersey, uh, joined the Navy when I was 17 right out of high school, and got involved in their boxing program. Um, Fought down in uh, Portsmouth in Norfolk, Virginia. Went to physical therapy school. Uh, after I graduated from that, I was stationed at the Naval Hospital in Philly and wanted to pursue my boxing uh, activity. And as it turns out, I, I am not exactly sure how it happened, but I found my way up to the uh, Frankfurt PAL up in North Philly, where I met uh, Roy Reddish Sr. and Roy Reddish Jr sort of working out at their gym and that's pretty much uh, how things started with the with the relationship there uh, one question Chuck so you basically had boxing experience from the Navy before you went to the gym a little bit yeah ah okay a bit. I okay had about maybe seven seven or eight fights okay um, smokers uh, that they had exactly in the Navy. exactly and, um, and, and that's where I got got my start um, really wasn't looking to go very far with it uh, but then when I got stationed in Philly uh, knowing that the reputation that the Philly fighters and the Philly fight scene had back then um, I thought you know I need to need to pursue this just to see to make sure that I'm not leaving anything behind um, and as it turns out it was a great experience I could not have met uh, two better guys uh, who were so to me so far from what the norm or the stereotype of boxing trainers are. When you say two guys, you mean Willie Reddy Sr. and Junior, sir? Yes. Thank um, you. Both very uh, caring. I felt they always looked out for their guys. Um, they looked out for me uh, in a way that, uh, um, you know, they knew that I wasn't from Philly, that I was in the Navy, coming from uh, South Jersey every night. 
And, you know, as much as I respected their efforts of being there, especially Willie, because I know Willie had a, a career at the time, and he was working a full day. And then he'd come at the gym at night. So real quick, when we say you're talking about junior senior, I know who you're talking about for, for the clarity of the audience, sir. Yeah. Um, Willie, Mr. Reddish Sr. was always Mr. Reddish to me. Oh, got gotcha. you. Um, and uh, Willie was always Willie. Okay. That way in my mind, I, I wouldn't, I got I wouldn't you. confuse them. I got you. And it was certainly out of a, out of a respect. And, and 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 real quick, sir, they are confusing because there's three of them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, Rocky was a little guy back then. Right, right. Um, I, I'm not sure exactly how old he was. I'm probably saying maybe five years old or so. Wow. Uh, which is good that they named him Rocky because that kind of takes away any of the confusion. Exactly. About who one, two, and three is. Right. But um, but yeah, Willie laid no favorites. Everybody was treated the same. And uh, but basically, what he was very big about and looked for, he's committing to you, as long as you're committing to him. And when you came up and, and gave everything uh, at night in the gym, you know he always appreciated your efforts, and he would you would find that he would give give more back to you. In my case, um, again, not being someone that he's seen for a long time or groomed since a little one. Um, you know, I come in and he didn't know me, I didn't know him, um, and we just kind of, you know, worked uh, through boxing and just created a, uh, a, a nice relationship of uh, mutual respect. Um, and he, you know, said, hey, you know, it's going to be tough and we're going to ask a lot of you. And he did, which I appreciated, and I think it certainly benefited me in many ways, uh, you know, throughout the life. One thing I remember is when, uh, and, and Willie knew all the players up there. I didn't know any of the players. I didn't know, you know, who the good fighters were, who the, you know, who the up and coming fighters were. But he, uh, we got a fight one night. He said, this, this is going to be a tough one. And uh, we fought at Henley's. And a guy uh, uh, took a decision from me. Um, no doubt about it. I mean, when, you, when that fight was over, it wasn't by a big margin, but he, he certainly had won the fight. And um, you know, I was a little down about that because six months earlier, a guy in the Navy fight uh, tuned me up pretty good. And I'm thinking, you know, maybe this is not, my, not the place that I want to be, not the sport that I want to be in. Maybe I just don't have the tools. And when I went back to the gym after the fight, Willie said to me, he said, uh, you know, Chuck, he said, I think if we train you a little differently, I think if we uh, work you a little harder, um, I, I think you've got some potential here. Uh, the kid that you just lost to, and I think he said he was like 18 and 0, 20 and 0, um, had a pretty big record. Willie knew all about his amateur career, and um, so that kind of pumped me up that he had more confidence in me than I had in me. So basically, guys, at, um, Mr. Redis, looking at your boxing ability, uh, recognize your raw talents which you didn't really have any uh, confidence in at the time. In fact, you said for a brief moment you were thinking about uh, quitting until he um, he encouraged you like, hey, man, no, you, you got the stuff. We just got to hone and sharpen it. And that's exactly what it was. And, and, and he did that. So we uh, went back to work, and he changed a lot of things. Um, uh, I was small for a light heavyweight, so he – kind of taught me just like they taught Joe Frazier how to get inside the punch, um, you know, how to work it from the inside and not be on the outside, uh, you know, catching the tail end of the jabs and, and, and the other punches. Um, we did about five more fights and then he said, okay, and we won. And then he said, we're, we're going back to Henley's. And we went back to Henley's and we fought the same guy who I'd lost to um, about two months before. And he put it just like this. He says, here's your measuring stick. Wow. This is, we're going to see exactly how much, how far we've come in the last couple months. And um, so we, uh, we fought, and this time things were a little different. I had won the decision uh, by about a similar margin that I lost before. It wasn't a, uh, you know, a real, it was a knockdown that I had on him. There was, um, 
you know, it was just a good, solid fight, but I felt, you know, I was better trained, I was better prepared. Mentally, I was way ahead of, of where I was, uh, you know, a few months before. Um, and as it turns out, that kid's name was Matthew Franklin. Wait a minute, hold that thought, sir. I'm just listening to you. So you're basically telling me that the fella who became your nemesis almost at the on start of your boxing career was light heavyweight champion Matthew Saad Muhammad? it was yeah. my goodness I remember when you and I were talking and when you told me you fought light heavyweight I thought to myself I said he's a little short to be a light heavyweight so now I'm familiar with uh, familiar with Curtis Parker so basically what you're telling me is you had a Bob and we boxing style similar to Curtis Parker's I would say, yeah, wow. a, a, very close to that. Um, I think, and you know, for a middleweight, he was probably a little shorter than most middleweights. Um, and if you watch him fight, I mean, he is a, a clone of Joe Frazier, uh, which uh, Mr. Reddish, you know, had a hand in that and developing him when he first came to town. Um, and that was their thing. They could take guys with, uh, you know, not as much size um, and just, you know, find something, a style that would adapt to what their physical abilities were. And, um, and for me, it was uh, the same thing as Curtis Parker. Um, what they really liked is they liked you to come to work every night. And I could tell after the first loss to uh, Matthew Franklin, um, the attitude kind of changed a little bit. And that's what really surprised me. Um, I felt that, you know, this is not for me, and when I come back in, Willie is kind of all excited, like, you know, hey, we, we can we can work on some things here. There's some things that we can improve, and, you know, so the attention that was being given to me um, got, you know, much more advanced, which now I really felt, I said, oh, geez, you know, I, somebody's paying attention, somebody recognizes, and to be somebody like the Reddishes was, was a pretty big deal for me. Well, you know what I think transpired, Chuck? I honestly, as I as I think about it, I think you I think you done better than, in the fight than you thought you, you you did. You know, I mean, I think you were you know because again, you you're the fighter, you're in the fight, and um, I think that more than likely, you were raising so much hell in that boxing ring that you didn't realize how well you were doing. You probably was just was feeling the licks coming your way, but Mr. Reddish and them. Obviously, seeing how you held your own against uh, Matthew Saad Muhammad, said, yo, man, he, this guy was in here with this guy's a killer, and this dude is really making a good account of himself. So I think that's what transpired, if you're asking me. And, and you're absolutely right. That, that's exactly you know how it was going. At that point, I'm looking at wins and losses, and you know they're looking at possibilities down the road. <clears throat> what they knew that I didn't know was just how good – Matthew Franklin was and how respected he was in the uh, in the boxing community at that point long before you know he extended his uh, incredible uh, professional career so for them to look at me and say okay you know we, we've got a, a, you know a little potential here made me feel really pretty pumped up we're in the uh, Golden Gloves tournament and uh, we're, we're going very well through there I think we won three or four fights 
um, all fights were stopped before the uh, before the final bell. So, sir, basically, sir, you're telling me you were a knockout artist. Uh, I could throw a pretty good, pretty good right hand that I felt, uh, you know, and Willie would even say the same. He said, you know, that right hand is laser on the point. Chuck, real quick, real quick, just a quick sidebar here. Did you get a lot of practice with that right hand and bars around the world being a rough and tumble <laughs> sailor? And, uh, you know, you know, when you hit the port, sir, did, is that where you honed that right hand at, Chuck? I'm just curious. Why you mention that? <laughs> you being a... You being an ex-military guy, you you know how you know how that all works. Yeah, there was, uh, you know, uh, confrontation was nothing I avoided. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and again, it was you know a lot of it was young and immature, um, but a lot of it was self-defense, and but it was nothing anything that I ever walked away from, and I think that's what really attracted me to boxing because I wanted to take that and just subdue it and just get it out of my system. And sure enough, once, you know, I got into that point, you know, my urge to be combatant was done. You know, I felt, okay, I'm accomplishing what I want to accomplish. Um, I have nothing to prove to anybody. I just feel really, really good about this. Mm -hmm. And um, so, you know, we're going through the, the Golden Gloves tournament. Oh, knockouts. That's really the last already, thing you're talking about. Yes, it is. Willie had already told me after the second fight, he said, you will see this guy again, Matt Franklin. And uh, sure enough, we were at the uh, Willingboro High School in, in South Jersey, and we were in the semifinal fight. And, um, you know, and I just kept on going. Willie just keep at it, keep at it. And uh, sure enough, we, we knocked him down again. And then we had a, uh, one a nice decision. So, so that was... You know, knowing that I had gotten past what was probably, according to Willie, my toughest fight now, and you know, we're next week we know we're heading to the Spectrum in a week or two, and uh, we're we're going to be fighting in the finals, fighting a gentleman by the name of Kenny Muse, who uh, was a West Philly guy, uh, but also known to be a, a a pretty tough tough fighter, and um, but I caught him with a right hand right at the end of the second round. He went down. Um, Willie had me jump right on him coming out of the third round, and then they stopped the fight with a with a minute left in the third round. So, um, so yeah, that was a, a great great experience for me. Um, but the thing with Matt Franklin, as it has played from that point, from the first fight, all the way to his um, funeral, was a uh, was a story for me. Um, my wife and I, who were living in Eastport, Annapolis, at the time when he uh, beat Marvin Johnson for the world title, to me, that's when it sunk in. Even though I was watching his career, I was seeing his fights, I would drive up there to watch his fights to Spectrum. I'd drive to Atlantic City. Um, and to just see that, you know, here's a guy that I fought who has now made it to the top um, was, was pretty pretty good feeling for me. I mean, never expected to get anything so much out of, you know, out of the boxing. Um, you and I, we uh, we briefly met at um, at Mr. Reddish's funeral, and from what I learned during the funeral, uh, that you and Mr. Reddish became very good friends after the fact. Yeah, uh, you know, they were just a royalty of. Uh, a Philly boxing. Mm -hmm. uh, I can remember as a teenager, I um, I would always get the Ring magazine, and I have, I think I still have a scrapbook of fighters. When they would fight, I would cut the paper. Cut. Uh, I think I got a scrapbook on Ike Williams. Okay. Bob Montgomery. Okay. Um, uh, Harold Johnson. The when they was Joe Lewis. When they would fight and they have the articles, I would cut them out and I'd put them in my scrapbook. Okay, okay. That's what I did. Right, right, right. Sounds to me, sir, like 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 boxing, because that's what that's what made me. That's what it was. It was the it was the guys like Bobby Boogaloo Watts, Curtis Parker, uh, Jesse Thunder Ferguson, Robert Bam Bam Hines, Buster Drake. These were my heroes. I, I wasn't really into football mm -hmm. and, and and basketball and baseball. I like 
contact sports. Okay. And um, I can remember terrible Tim Witherspoon, yes. you know, talking to me about the hazards of uh, of um, you know, doing drugs. Right. Um, I can remember Boogaloo Watts, you know, when we finished training over at the Twenty Third Pal because I used to come between the Twenty Third Pal and the Champ Gym owned by Quinzel McCall. Yes. Twenty Third Pal operated by uh, Philip Allen. And um, these 23rd? guys, twenty third pal. I'm Operating talking about doing by Philip Allen. I'm talking about in the in the seventies and the eighties and the nineties. Doing do, 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 do your high. time, sir. Doing my time is. See, you got to look at it, sir. It's something like it's like forty years between the two of us. So okay. you know, we yeah. talking about different police officers. You talking about Duke, who I never met. Oh, and I'm talking about well, I'm a young kid compared oh. to you, sir. I mean, I'm I'm forty nine, so yeah, I know you yeah. at least fifty. So, <laughs> so, Thank you. so uh, you know. I was in the amateur program. I didn't turn pro, but I was in the amateur program. Speaking on the amateur program, the way Chuck and I met, uh, Chuck and I met uh, during the uh, Junior Olympics. I think it was 1983. 1983 Junior Olympics, sir. That's right. It was and up there at, uh, in the area of 40th and Harrisford, sir. That's right. And uh, we had we were fighting at 139 pounds, believe it or not. So that was, that was many, many years ago. I beat Chuck on a, on a split decision. Chuck always disputes the decision, uh, but you know, I beat him on a split decision, and and I can I can I can say that Chuck had a beautiful right hand, and uh, he used to love to throw that right hand, and uh, what he would do is he would he would jab, step, throw a little feint, and then try to drop the right hand on you. That was his that was his mode of operation, and uh, we're going to the second round. Uh, when I went back to the corner. My grandfather said he likes he likes to throw that right hand. He said, "I want you to take a half a step back and feign him, and then when he throws that right hand, I want you to counter." And that's exactly what we did. And he lost that second round. He know he lost that second round. He won the first. He lost the second. Third was a toss up. Both of us were tired as hell, <laughs> sore. <laughs> Couldn't wait for the fight to be over. <laughs> but. Um, Thus, you know, we, we blossom into um, well-rounded uh, men and um, still have a friendship to this day, which, is, which leads us uh, to this uh, very, very good interview. Well, with that said, right, that's not how I remember it, but I'm not going to, I'm not going to dispute, I'm not going to dispute my friend here, because one thing about, about boxers a lot of times we might get in there and try to kill each other, but after after the fight is over, we're perfect gentlemen. We're back to being friends. Exactly. And if no one doesn't get knocked out, that's the beauty of it being in a fight when no one gets knocked out, and it's a close decision. Yes, sir. You can dispute it for the rest of your life, and you can argue about it and laugh about it and joke about it. <laughs> when um when I bumped into uh Mr. Reddish Senior. The last thing in the world I was expecting to do was bump into uh, one of the individuals who I fought against because when I fought that night, I not only fought Willie Reddish the third, I was in competition against Willie Reddish Jr. and Willie Reddish Sr. So I was fighting all three of them. They sent him out to do the dirty work. <laughs> but at the end of the day, I never thought I would see any of them again. And then Willie bumped into, we bumped into each other at the gym and we became friends again and I inadvertently bumped into his dad whom I disputed the decision with and <laughs> me and his dad went back and forth with it and at the end Mr. Rudder said one thing he said what did the judges say and I pretty much just acquiesced just to keep from yelling and arguing with him because he would have <laughs> went back and forth with me all day your father and I became pretty good friends in that short amount of time. Good. And I wouldn't go as far as to say I become like a son to him, but I, we develop a uh, like an uncle and a nephew relationship. And I liked your father so much, sir, I even introduced him to my mother-in-law. So, oh, that's wonderful, man. Yeah, I introduced him to my mother-in-law, you know, they, and they became, uh, they became pretty good friends. Okay. I only met your grandfather that one time, and I didn't, I couldn't actually say I met him. Okay. But you know, in meeting your in meeting your dad, right. man, I felt that I know not just you right. more. Right. I knew I got to know your sister. Through, right. You know, being around your dad, I right. got to know your grandfather. Right. And I learned a lot about your uncle. I can't remember right. the name. Is uncle, that the one Frank in Baltimore? Reddish. Yeah, my grandfather's brother. 
Yeah, yeah, I learned a lot about you. I think him and your grand, him and your dad were really, really tight. Yeah, he was like a father to my father. Right, right, man. So it's a wonderful thing, man. And with that said, well, <laughs> um, this is this has been a, a a great interview. I really enjoy getting to know you and your family through your father, Thank my brother. You, man. Appreciate you, Chuck. Sir, so, so what was it like, you know, you know, hanging out with Sonny Liston after a hard wonderful. day of training? It was wonderful, and, and and believe it or not, believe it or not, Sonny Liston and I were, were buddies. I believe that. I heard you know, that. He all. lived on 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 Dunlap Street. Okay. I lived about three blocks away, and um, we would go out socially. Wow. You know, and I can remember. Were you guys close to the same age? Or was he older than you, sir? I think I was older than he was. Really? Wow. Okay. Yeah. And. Um, and we would do road work. I can remember one time we did road work. He left me. Wow. I didn't have a car token in my pocket or anything. Right. But fortunately, the, the bus driver let me get on the bus. Cause okay. I was way out there in 69th Street. Wow. Running with him, and he's gone. Wow. <laughs> well, Sonny had to get ready for a fight. Probably I know, training for I know, Ali. He couldn't I wait know. around for you, sir. No, I mean, come on. Yeah, you I can't know. get. You're not. Hold on. Wait a minute, sir. <laughs> You said something to me earlier about holding on. You're not still upset with Sonny because he left you out 69th Street, are you? No. You that's sure, my sir? Buddy. She's positive. Well, that's, what you mentioned it for if well, you weren't mad at Sonny? Something, I was just something that happened, you know? <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, we, sir. We went over to a Latin Casino. I don't know if you can remember that old no, Jersey. No, well, sir. you're just a baby. 1968, I was You're just born, a sir. baby. You're just a baby. Yeah. And we go over there, and, and uh, after he won the title, the, the manager say, bring him over. We go over. Um, you know, and we were just buddies. Right, right, Just right. buddies, you know? It, and, is it true, sir? Because from what I, I heard, I was speaking to a gentleman the other day on Sunday Listen, and from what I'm told, Sunday loved Philadelphia. It's one of his favorite places in the world. He wished he was born here, but he wasn't. But I heard it said that, uh, that, that the late mayor Frank Rizzo That's the ran, ran Sonny out, ran him out, out of ran him out of Philip. Well, what was that about, sir? He didn't no, like. He it. just that was him. That's all. I don't know. Wow. I don't know. Wow. I, you know, he ran him out. Mm, mm, mm. Sonny, you know, Sonny, son was all right. You know, I can't say. People say, well, he was it. I, I can only tell people about how the person treats me. Right. Right. And if somebody say, well, this guy's a good guy and he treated me wrong. I say he's not to and, me. And you and Sonny, Sonny was a good guy. And he good treated you guy, right. good guy, good guy. We if we go somewhere, something he say you drive the Cadillac. I can remember. What kind of Cadillac, sir? Brand new, 1967, whatever it was. Okay. Brand new. In fact, he had just hold away. He just bought the Cadillac. My mother. Now, my mother and father, they were divorced, but, you know, they were still buddies. Right, She right. invited Sonny over for dinner, he and his wife, and he just had the brand new Cadillac. Okay. My mother lived at New North Philly, 25th in Haggard. We had a business there. And um, we're sitting there, and my father, oh, that's a brand new Cadillac, da 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 Sonny said to him, if I win the heavyweight championship, I'm going to give you this car. Wow. He knocked out Patterson, handed him the keys. Wow. Time. Thank you, Chuck. Bam. Bam. My man. My man.